Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 332 for Monday, January 10th, 2022. <music> Greetings, folks. And welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in, uh, I was going to say Las Gatas, California, but I actually am not in Las Gal- Gatas, California. In Napomo, California, to Paul Kent. Yeah, suddenly I thought we'd rewound a year or something. So. <laughs> Two. <laughs> Two, that's right. Oh, man, has it been? It's amazing how time flies. Yep. Yeah. It really has. We've, we've kind of lost a year you know, one of our, one of our collective years is kind of in, yeah. it's like the lost Lennon's lost, John Lennon's lost weekend. Yeah, it's true. There's, um, there, 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 but, but, you know, we don't stop aging during those years. We got a, we got a note from listener Barry after we were talking last week about, I mentioned that I got to see Genesis and we dug into that a little bit and he says, uh, I want to say thanks for the quick overview of the Genesis concert. And some of the thoughts around it, we were fortunate to see them in Chicago in November. Like you said, Phil wasn't bouncing around the stage, but he still put on a hell of a show. Between aging and COVID, we know some of these bands won't be touring much longer, so it's time to fill in the gaps of bands that we haven't seen. While they aren't the same, and in some cases quite literally with bandmate changes, it still is an awesome live music experience. Uh, And he named Sticks and Journey as bands he's seen recently. Get out there and enjoy it while we still can. And he's he's right. Like, you know, these, there are these legacy bands out there that um, if it's worth it to you to see them, make it, make an effort of going to see them because any of these tours that these bands are doing could be the, you know, could be the last time around. So sure. Yeah. Just good, good advice. Uh, you know, I'm glad I got to see Genesis again. It was a very different Genesis as I, you know, as I mentioned last week, uh, then who, who exactly was in the band in, in Genesis. Yeah. The current, the, who toured this tour? Um, I mean, it was Tony Banks and Phil Collins and Mike Rutherford. And then playing drums was Phil's son, Nicholas. Got it. Yeah. And then they had two male backup, uh, singers that were, one of whom was hitting a lot of Phil's high notes for him or with him, depending on the, the moment. And then the other one was actually singing harmonies and like playing percussion and stuff. So, yeah. 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 It's, it, you know, it's funny because uh, the, the most obvious one to me would be the who, which is now the two, right? Is that <laughs> yeah. the who? Right. No. You know, if, no. if half the band is gone, it is, is it still, but it's still Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey. I mean, you know, Correct. right. So, I mean, I guess you go to see your heroes, right? So if you're a Who fan, or if you're a Pete Townshend fan or a Roger Daltrey fan, yep. I mean, that's interesting. Journey's kind of an interesting one where it's not the same singer. Right. 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 Uh, it, it is interesting. I mean, the guy, the, the yeah. guy who replaces him is, is very good and, you know, sounds pretty much like it. And obviously, Neil Sean is the foundation of that band, in my opinion. But, but you know, those songs, that band... You know, once they added Steve Perry, became something different than they originally were. It evolved, and, yeah, yeah. They they wrote lights together, and that was the end of that, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Journey Journey changed that day, and 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 became a much larger part of the American songbook uh, at that no. point. Yeah, they were super cool before that in a yes. different way, right? In a different way. That's yeah. But most people don't even know about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I guess it's. I, I think the point is well taken by Barry is like, you know, these are the soundtracks of our lives, whatever's left of them. If you have a chance to go enjoy it one more more time, as long as you'll enjoy it, of course, you know, I don't think you tear it down if it's not what it was because what is what it was, right? I I don't think it's the point uh, that it's not what it was. Correct. It is, it is that artist taking, taking you on the ride of, of those songs that, uh, that held you well for so many years and here's where they are now and here's what they do with it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you just yeah, yeah. It's um, I mean, it's all changed. I was thinking, I, you know, like well, today I, I love is Bob Seger. T- today is the day that we found out two years ago that Neil Peart had passed. Uh, right. It was right. It was the seventh uh, when he actually passed, but nobody knew until uh, a few days later. And and you know, as we're having this conversation, it's like, well, I'm super glad. I mean, I I saw Rush a bunch during their career. It wasn't just the final tour, but 
when they announced their final tour, it was pretty clear that it was going to be final, uh, especially for those of us that read the tea leaves and, you know, kind of knew where things had been going. We didn't know Neil was sick. Uh, I don't yeah. think at that point Neil knew Neil was sick. So, but, you know, it was still pretty clear that, well, this might be the last chance you get to see this band live. And I'm super thankful that I, I got to see it. And I'm even more thankful that I got to bring my kids to it, both of whom in their own ways are, are fans of the band, my, my son especially. So, um, yeah, it like, you know, was that show the same Rush show that I saw, it, you know, in 85 when I first started seeing them? No. Was Getty's voice the same as it was in 85? No. You know, uh, have the songs evolved? Yeah. Uh, but am I glad I got to see him? Yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I mean, it's, it's someone who created a piece of art that, you know, time affects the ability to, to deliver that art. But yeah. does, does the artist, it, it, it's like, um, remember there was this long period of time where there's a lot of hate going on for David Lee Roth, right? Because he couldn't hit the notes, but he wasn't changing the keys, and 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 uh, and it became a, a pretty bad. Yeah, and his stage presence, he didn't evolve. It, or it, his, it, he he evolved. His choice to evolve, it, yeah. right? He the choices he, he made. The choices he made did not match the the realities of his evolution. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so maybe maybe yeah. that's what a part of it is. I mean, if it, you know. If if your favorite artist is struggling with how to evolve, and they make a bunch of choices that make it a worse experience for you, maybe that that's the answer about whether you want to go see whether it. You want to go see it, yeah. And I could yeah. see like with this Genesis show, I was never a Genesis was never one of those bands that was sacred for me. Uh, I appreciate much of what they did, but it just never captured me, you know, in, in the way that it, that Genesis did many, many people. And I, I could see where some of them would be like, oh yeah, this is not the band I wanted to see. It's like, okay, yeah. then great. Then don't go see that. Then the band you wanted to see, hopefully you already saw them because th that, that you'll never have another chance. Yeah. That part's yeah. over, but that's also okay. Like it, yeah. it's, you know, it, it's, there's no wrong way to appreciate that, which you appreciate, right? I think it's, <laughs> It's an emotional reaction. So, but just yeah. being honest, like, I think your point is, is, is great. Just know what you're getting and, and then make a it's decision. A show. If yeah. you're going to enjoy it, then go enjoy it. Great. And if you're not, then find something else. It's great. Sure. No problem. I, I was going to bring up the point about Bob Seger, who I love. Yeah. You know, Seger had a crazy range in his prime, right? Yeah. Everything's down a step to a step and a half, you know, pretty much now. And you know what? Nobody cares. It's still Bob Seger singing those songs. That's right. That's right. Yep. I'm sure somebody cares, but you know. really there were people that cared that Genesis dropped tunes, you know, it's like, Oh, I couldn't listen because it was not in the original key. And it's like, man, I'm easy. Well, I, you know, I've always said, I'm super happy that I don't have perfect pitch. I have really good relative pitch. And I, and that's, that's enough for me because I, I don't, care if like if i'm playing in a band and somebody's like all right tonight we're you know playing down a half step i've been with some singers that are like oh i can't i can't do it and it's like that's i mean like okay like fine like that's your thing like i mean that's your instrument and for whatever reason you know the songs the way you know them in these keys and dropping it a half step messes with you great i mean then don't drop them if you're the singer by all means sing them where you're comfortable but it, you know but i've i like i i do not it does not bother me and i'm thankful for that because i'm a really picky person in a lot of other ways and so i'm glad that one does i rarely do i even notice it and even if i do it's like okay well that's fine it's all good for me and I'm thankful for that. So, because yep. I'm, like I said, I'm a picky person in a lot of other ways. So yep, yep. I'll, I'll, I'll take, I'll take the win. <laughs> what else we got, man? I had an interesting conversation with a good friend of mine who is a, a great performer, great singer. And um, this person was kind of sharing some frustration that a couple of venues that they have, act, I'm, I'm going to use a, a gender neutral pronoun here. Um, that they have played or that they've had some interest from, they're not getting 
you know, calls back to finish a booking deal. And, you know, it was frustrating. And mm. it got me thinking about, about the booking process and, you know, ego in booking and, and pride. And, you know, the funny thing is, is, as my friend is relaying this conversation to me, I was like, well, imagine moving somewhere where nobody knows you or your reputation <laughs> and you're, you're starting from scratch. And, you know, that's what I've been kind of living through is like, I don't have a draw like I had in my previous place of residence and yep. yet. And um, so, you know, in one way, I'm enjoying the challenge, rolling up my sleeves and seeing if I can kind of recreate the, the, the I, I use the term relatively success that I had up in the Bay Area. And, um, you know, just getting back to basics. And it's actually, it's a good challenge. It is humbling, but the humility is actually part of the motivation for me. Like, I'm really determined to, you know, get a full booking schedule down here. And there are a lot of good musicians. And especially coming out of COVID, where a lot of good musicians wanted their gigs back. And so there was a big rush to get the people who were loyal to certain venues or venues loyal to certain people. You know, that whole thing has been shaking out over the past year. But... You know, I have my process. I have the amount of time I spend each day on booking. Um, you know, I, I, I when I take new video, I'll 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 share it and just say, hey, just keep in touch. But I'm mostly just thinking about how uh, taking ego out of the booking process is just a good reminder, and to remember that it's a sales process. You know, and and to a great degree. Um. The, the, basic, the basic equation here is you hire live music. You want good quality live music. I am good quality live music. Let's do, let's do some business together. Now, convincing the person that you actually are what you, what you say and that you can value them is, is part of the art that has part to go on here. Part but. of the, yeah. Well, you, you've, as you've been talking here, you've used one word over and over again, and I think it's worth highlighting it. And the word is process. It, if you Treat this like it's a process at which you work. And if you make it through the process, you will have results at the end. That I think is going to wind up with far better results and far more happiness out of uh, you than it. And I'm not talking to you specifically, Paul, though. I mean, it, it, it does apply. It applies mm -hmm. to all of us, uh, it, you know, it, but I know you know this. Uh, that's going to work out far better than if you look at it as a you know, personal reflection or something, it, you know, these people have a, the, the people to whom you are selling have a lot of people who are selling to them and they are making decisions based on all sorts of factors, some of which you will be privy to many of which you will not. And it's not up to you to decide who plays at any given venue, unless you happen to be the one managing Own the venue. owning the venue. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and so it, there will be places that, in from your vantage point are a perfect fit. And from the management slash booking vantage point are never going to be a fit. And if you happen to be friendly with that person, maybe they will tell you this and why, but otherwise you will never know why it, it, it it's a no. And, and that's true of sales in general. And, and again, I come back to the word process because you just have to apply the process and refine the process and learn about the process. And, and the process is the same for all of us, but, but different for all of us. We have our unique bands. We have our unique scenarios. We have our unique set of clubs to whom we are pitching. And so it, it's not one size fits all, but it's, you know, there, there's some things to it that are going to be common. One of them, and I used to say this all the time, especially like when we started in the, I never expected to be in the the web ad sales business, right? Or podcast ad sales business. It was a byproduct because we started this website and I needed to generate money. <laughs> yeah, somebody needed to do it. And there was no Google AdSense or any of the stuff that exists now. Now, if I were smarter, I would have just built one of those things and then we'd be doing this on uh. nicer microphones, maybe or something, I don't know. Uh, but... Um, you know, so we, we, I would start doing, I did the sales cause it was like, it was up to me to figure out how to bring the money in. And I learned two things really quickly. Number one, sales is a process rooted in rejection. I always say if I make 20 phone calls and I get 19 no's, 
that's a successful venture because I got the one yes that I needed to sell the thing that I needed and put some money in the box. That's it. Mm -hmm. Right. And, but that's a lot of no's. And if you get hung up on any one of them, and certainly many of them, you'll never make it to the the one that's going to, that's going to hit for you. And also if you let it shake your confidence, that one that would have hit for you probably won't because you're showing up and being like, look, I know that it's probably a no, but I just, I wanted to say anyway, we'd love to play at your club and maybe you'll say yes, but I know you're probably going to say no, right? Like that conversation is going to go a whole lot differently than the same conversation or the, the, the conversation with the same person. Where you're like, Hey, I'm Dave from such and such a band. Ah, we've got a great thing going on here. I think it would be a good fit for your club. Do you have some time for me to, to tell you about it now? Or, or maybe we could set up some time later, right? There's some, there's a confidence in, in the second mm -hmm. one that just was somewhat lacking in the first example. And well, the thing is, is when you take the one, yes, and use that as the basis of your, like, bingo, like, you know, that that's your worldview as opposed to that 19 people are probably going to say no for a whole bunch of reasons. And you, you start to believe your own press that that one person who hired you who thinks you're great or, you know, was happy yeah. that day or, or that your, your demo open, turn the lights on for them, that you think that that's the way it is going to be. I think the really valuable thing that you said is you have no idea what happens to, you know, with the other 19. I, I, I'll hear I'll, Let me take a deeper dive in a different way. Sure. So there's a, a good music venue, very good music venue down here. And when I moved down here, one of the first things I did was I reached out and I Facebook friended the guy said, hey, I'm a new musician in the area. I um, just want to introduce myself. Um, I have a, a band that I, you know, I would like to bring down and I think would be good you know, for, for your venue. And he said, welcome. He sent me a note saying, welcome to the area. Nice. Group. Now, um, all subsequent efforts to reach out to him have gone radio silent. Right? Oh. <laughs> to the point where- This now, is classic, uh, by the way. Like this so is my friend, in my any friend business. Nick, so my friend Nick, my house rocker buddy Nick, he has a Zappa project, even with some really interesting things. He's got a member of Zappa's band fronting his band, right? Yep. And uh, there probably is a good connection for this guy to, um, you know, th th I think that I actually think that would be a good match. You know, it's a college town. There's mm. a lot of really interesting musical tastes down here. I actually think that, that it, he would do very well down here. However... My efforts to try and help Nick out and connect the two guys, the guy has been radio silent to me. Nick's efforts to reach out directly, he hasn't got anything. And I am going through a full range of emotions, probably based upon the fact that the guy did respond to me yeah. in the beginning and just say, hey, you know, I'm a friendly person. I'll be communicative with you, right? I hate, and I'm I hate like, that oh, more than anything else in the sales. <laughs> no, because I've dealt with it too. You know, I mean, and, and again, it's not just this business. It's every business where you get... Somebody, and I'm sure I've done it to people too. Like that's the worst part of this is it's, it's just how it works. Somebody says, Hey, I'm new. You're a friendly person. You say, you say welcome, right? Like that's great. And then when they say, all right, now I want to transact want with something. you. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, Oh yeah, I don't have time for that. I mean, I can say welcome and hi, but I've got, you know, these other, you know, 45 bands that I'm working with that, that fill up my schedule. We humans are creatures of habit. We like things to go the way we like them to go. And if that hasn't been proven to you in the last two years, I don't think I'm going to be able to change your mind with the silly little podcast that we do here. Not that it's silly, but you get my point. Can we comparison to COVID pandemic, right? Yep. Uh, yeah. You know, we like our things the way we like our things. And, and so when you show up and say, hey, I'm Paul, I'm new, essentially what you're saying to that person, again, perspective is, Hey, here's a wrench to throw in my works. I don't know if this person is telling the truth or not. Sure, I could bounce one of my 45 bands to put this cat in, and maybe he's exactly right in telling me the truth, and this is going to be amazing for me. Or maybe it's going to be a disaster for me, and now my you know 45th band is now playing for somebody else because they're mad at me that I bounced them, and now I don't have them back. So which path do I, the person who likes to have things just operate smoothly, which path is it I'm going to take? You know, well, let me, like, let's pause here. Cause I'm going to, uh, let me give you my thought process. There. Sure. So I am keenly aware that his initial friendliness, I overplayed a little bit in my mind. However, we all do it. We all do it. Yeah. Where I sit is now remember value for value, right? You've got a business objective. I've got a business objective. Let's do business is the kind of the basis that I, you know, try to get relationships to. Yep. It's usually more, way more heavy lifting on the seller than on the sell E. But, but I'm thinking to myself, 
this guy has a venue. Um, his job, he doesn't own the venue. His job is to bring in the best things that will fill that up, right? Yeah. That that's when he's delivering his value to his boss is by presumably. So he should have these conversations. Right. And if there's 45 people a day who wants to have them, he should take 45 conversations a day if that's what will get that person's venue filled. Because I've been by that venue and seen it half filled. Mm. And so, you know, he's not he's not right all the time. So I, I would simply say I get that he's probably barraged. Yeah. But now I have an opinion that this guy's ability to discern um, business-like from non-business-like. And again, I'm, I'm taking this out. Yeah, out you're projecting. Here, yeah, right? that's right. But that's how, that's, this is the problem, right? Is we, 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 have, <laughs> we have this, this subset of truth and, and it leads us to believe one apparent truth. And that may or may not be correct. In fact, in yeah. most cases, it's not. You know, how close is it to that other person's reality? Um, you know, I don't know. Probs probs very different. <laughs> Cause if they fully agreed with you, they would hire you. <laughs> it's very simple. There's also no the other few thing people is, choose to do things that they see as irrational, right? Um like, well here's the deal. You have to add into this process rationality and justice do not are not parts of the equation, mm -hmm. right? So it is entirely likely this guy's just booking with people that he likes. Or, or, you know, yeah. or, you know, has some side game where, you know, he has a booking agency out of L.A., which is where he gets all his bands. And that, you know, I'm not saying this is what's happening, but, no. you know, is this guy could be kickback for this or it could be right. So there you, you don't know with, and you'll never all know. sorts of stuff that, you know, and you will never know yeah. it would be in music is a tough business in this way in that I guess all sales to some degree are a tough business. Your ability to, to know is kind of your job on the selling part, right? Like, yeah. you know, to be able to say, hey, you know, I, I remember when I first started out with the band, uh, there was a club, there, there weren't that many. There was one that was perfect for our, it had a stage that would fit our band. I used to call this booking person. I used to leave songs on their voicemail. <laughs> I would make up songs about why they should book us. Anything to just stick out, you know, get them to pause and think about me, you know, for a second. Um, and eventually they, all right, you got me right. Which was, and you exactly say you're not a songwriter. And <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but that was it. I was like, you know, what will make me stick out? I do get that there are 45 or 450 other people trying to get this person's attention. I do get that. Um, and the belief that that person on the other end of the phone has that I'm a worthy business partner for this. I get that that's the challenge. Right. Yep. I don't assume I do assume that someone is legitimate and that they're what their role. You know, I'm not that they're not a Monday laundering operation. Sure. They have they have business, you know, uh, um, goals that I wouldn't that, want to be a part of that. are but, Yeah. Their business goals are evident or at least at face value. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So, you know, this one venue, I'll be like, you know, you want to, you want to fill your club. I think, you know, I know everybody tells you that they want, that they think they can fill your club, but let me tell you why, you know, here, here's a guy who sold X amount of millions of records. And there, here's a guy who has a reputation and a, and a fan base and a, and a mailing list and all this type of stuff. If that doesn't open the door, it, it's pretty tough. I think, you know, if you can't, you, you know, if you get to the heart, like everybody's like, I'm great. That, that will bury you. Right. Cause everybody says I'm great. Right. 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 If you want to get a gig, but if you, you know, like here, here's five business reasons why we should have a conversation. And if that doesn't at least get you a, I'm interested, let's talk more or, you know, some advancing of the ball, you know, to, to move it to another place where you get a chance to, you know, prove that you are real. That's when things get really tough. And, you know, venue owners, you know, go ahead. I, ha I have a crazy thought, but, but go ahead. Well, I mean, they, they come from all sorts of places. I, I've worked with booking people who have huge egos, and then they are the, per, per, uh, the per only purveyor in their minds of what is quality music and what is not. You know, n nobody would ever, you know, bluegrass sucks, you know, whatever it might be, right? Right, right. And then there's some people who are just, it's not quite the same as the day job life you and I have lived, which is much more show me the money. It's, it, it, you know, like, like, business facts once we kind of get into the realm of art it feel and in and booking it feels as though there's a gray a greater gray than in the making ad sale yeah oh yeah, for sure because it's not 
because there is an element of it that is not just business. Yes. Uh, especially more so from one side than the other, right? From the seller than, than the sellee in, in most cases. Of course, it's, you know, there's, there's no two that are exactly the same, but there's a lot. But as we're, as we're having this, I had this crazy idea. You know, the there's this philosophy, this tactic, if you will, in sales where the idea is if you can figure out what your prospect's objections are and then you can take those away that leads them to yes, right? So if you say, well, I don't want to buy the, if you say to somebody and be careful of this when, when you're being pitched, because, because you were about to be manip, you are about to outsmart yourself in, in a lot of cases. If you say to somebody, well, I, I would buy this car, but you know, it, it doesn't have leather seats. And I, I you know, I, we, we had a car without leather seats and, and it's just like, it's a pain to clean up. It's much easier. You've just given that person the key to Sorry. making a sale. Yep. Right. Because all they need to do is turn that car that you were about to buy w into that same car, but with leather seats. And now you've already told them what it's going to take to get you to say yes. And so they're going to say, oh, well, over here, I have that same car, but with leather seats. And so here you go. Sign now. And you're going to get caught up in the momentum and sign. Right. It's like it's how this works. And I don't mean you're going to get caught up. You're going to get caught up in the embarrassment of Correct. like, you don't want to, you want to be that guy who said I would do it, but, and then the, but is answered, the but is answered. Right. Yeah. So they are preying on human nature. And, and, and this is, this happens all the time. It's, we all do it. It's part of marketing. It's part of everything, right? Like it's, we're always working on human nature with one another. It's just how it is. So there's no reason if you can engage with the club owner to find out, okay, Hey, look, I understand, you know, you're in business. What are the things that you look for? What are the things that I don't have yet to bring to the table and help me solve this problem for you? Right. And, and that's another way. That's another one of those tactics is help me solve this problem for you. Now I've solved the problem. Now you buy. Right. And so if you can, you know, if they can, if you can get them to put the objections on the table and then you can take them away well, and you might not be able to take them away. They might be able to say, yeah, well, you know, we just, we like to have bands that have, you know, a mailing list of 5,000 people because we know percentage wise, how many people are actually going to come to the gig. And so if, if your mailing list is less than that, it doesn't work for us. Well, now you got to go and build up your mailing list to 5,000 5, yeah. people, right? Like that, th th these, I don't mean to say that all the objections are going to be easy to take away, but you come up with the list and you, and then you go work on that list. And but uh, you know what it's going to take, but I mean, you now, now know what now it's going to take. It's not abstract. It's now, it's now very specific. It's, and, I had a guy, but, but I, a it, guy. Uh, one, one thing I wonder, and I've never done this from this standpoint. I've never known anyone to do it from this standpoint, but. I wonder how valuable it would be for the person in charge of booking your band to go take a one day sales seminar because they're going to teach you a lot of these tricks, right? You know, especially these one day things, they're super compressed. And usually the way they work is you, you know, your morning is we're going to, we're just going to bury you in all of these tricks, probably at a more rapid pace than we're burying you right now in them. Right. And, and there's going to be a lot more of them. Then you have lunch and then you come back from lunch. And what do you do? You start making calls and they tell you to show up at these sales seminars with prospects. Okay, great. So, you know, most people, the problem is they show up at sales seminars. It's not that they don't have uh, the techniques, although the techniques, we can all, always learn something. Most people show up without enough prospects. So you go show up with your prospects and then start making your calls and using these techniques on people. And I bet you know, you're not going to get everybody to answer the phone when you, when you do it or, you know, when you send out the email. If you're a musician, you know all your prospects of, of all the clubs around you. And so now you're just in this environment of people making calls. And it's even a little competitive because you're like, oh, who's going to who? It's not about who's going to make the most sales today. It's about who's going to call the most prospects today. That's how these things usually process. work. It be, Yeah. Right back to process. Right. And so I wonder how valuable that would be for somebody. If you've got a band that when you do play, you earn you know, I would say even between 500 and a thousand bucks per gig, it's not going to take too many gigs for your profits to pay off. You know, one of these, you know, these sales seminars are like 300 bucks a day or whatever. You, like you can find them at the local holiday inn or you know, whatever hotel. I would sign up open. for the Dave Hamilton school of sales. I think that sounds like a very valuable place to go. Jeez, that's the last thing I need to start. Man. <laughs>
Yeah. So anyway, one booking guy. I, I want to tell you about this. I don't know. We don't have an email address. You can't find me. I got to go. Bye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Feedback yeah. at gigabpodcast.com. Um, there's a guy who books, uh, he booked one good, good venue in this area or the last area I lived. And then he moved to another one. And I remember I got a golden tip from someone, this guy's, and he was a very experienced booking guy. The yep. magic word to this guy was phone tree. He was like, I don't care how many fans you say you have. I don't care about, you know, anything. What I want to know is that the band members are going to get on the phone and tell people they have a gig with us. That's the most effective thing. And a band that's willing to do that, they'll play my venues. Interesting. Um, and so, you know, I was fortunate enough to be given, you know, that that feedback. But, you know, Dave, that's not really a whole lot different. I always tell you that you gave me that one piece of advice when we were just starting in about work in the crowd at, at your breaks, right? Break yeah. is not break time. You're still on the clock. And, you know, that's how you get loyalty. That's how you get connections. That's how you do those sorts of things. It is an all-the-time thing. Yeah. And, you know, I, I can I can also guess that the, the the bands that do this, that try to make a living for it, this is why it's – it's so frustrating when it's uh, it's the real part time bands that'll take a gig for free. I mean, this is soul sucking work. I mean, it is really, really you know, like you want to play music and be be an artist, but you know that you have to get on the phone and you have to do this type of stuff. Yeah, some people say, oh, it's a cool challenge. I like it. I totally get it. I would hasten to guess most musicians would rather not have to deal with the booking part. But they <laughs> understand. They yeah. understand that it's necessary, but it is rejection is not fun. I mean, unless your head is totally spun around where you can really believe that one out of 20 is a good day. Oh no. Right. I, I say it all the time, but it doesn't mean that I can live it. No, every, every bit of rejection sucks. It's like, Oh crap. I put a lot of work into that, man. Crap. Like, why aren't they saying yes? Like, I, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, I know. We were just having this conversation in, uh, well, actually in multiple bands that I'm in, but I was going to say in Bitter Pill, you know, there's one club we'd like to play and it's an obvious fit and yet we can't get them to catch. And it's like, we know everybody there. We like, it's weird that this hasn't been a yes yet, but it hasn't been a yes. And it's super freaking frustrating. And then... We get a call from another one, and I'm not going to mention club names here, uh, especially on the second one. Uh, uh, th yeah, we'd love to have you. You know, as a, a booking agent that was just starting up working with this club, good people. And then it was like, yep, okay, here's the date. Are you open? Yeah, okay, great. And then it came out, oh, it's pay to play. It's like, ah, interesting, you know. Better to find out. I mean, I suppose you'd have to find out because, you know, one good question to ask, don't get weird about money. Always ask or tell what your fee is like. That's it's a you know, as you've been saying, it's a business relationship. They're going to have you play. You're going to get paid like or, or you're going to get compensated. Hopefully you're getting paid in dollars. But, you know, whatever that compensation is, make sure it's fair. Uh, but don't be afraid to have the money conversation. That that should be had first or very yeah. close to the beginning. And yeah, this one, you know, we got everybody's availability. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's all good. And it was like, oh, yeah, that gig's not happening. It's pay to play. Like, yeah, I, I didn't even know that we had clubs around here that were pay to play. But I think it's a club that hasn't had bands before. They're starting up for this spring or summer or whatever it is. And, you know, I, I don't I don't I have no idea how they came to this decision, but maybe they heard about it somewhere and it was like, oh yeah, you know, bands, bands would want to be in front of our people or whatever it is. And I was like, yep, not this band, but good luck with that. So, <sighs> you know, that's how it goes. Yeah. I, yep. I would just say, sum this all up. You have to em embrace process, work your process, yeah. tweak your process, right? If it's not working, if you're not getting calls back, you know, at all, if you're not getting any kind of light bulbs going on, and you'll know this. I mean, whatever your metric is, one out of 20 or one out of 50 or, you know, 10 yeah, out of 20. Yeah, right? you'll learn. Yeah. <laughs> you'll learn, and then you tweak it. Like I said, I'm I'm going through it again in a different way. You know, when I was up in the Bay Area, I could say, hey, I'm Paul from the House Rockers. You know, here's – the and, and generally, 22 years of being around, there was some recognition that would at least open a door, right? You know, like, there was some name recognition. Going down here where there's absolutely none, I've had to go back, you know, to – absolute fundamentals come up with, you know, form emails that I diligently send out a hundred of them, you know, every Sunday night, you know, hoping that it'll be first thing in their inbox on Monday morning. And, you know, and if that doesn't work, <laughs> I'll do it Monday night. Right. And just yeah. every variable in the process, I'm just trying like, yep. you know, how do I address someone? Um, you know, everybody's like, dear so-and-so hope, hope you are well. Right. You know, you don't, it, I, 
when I get those things, I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every word in this email is of use. You got to be short. You got to be succinct. You know, you got to provide the electronic press kit easily accessible. You know, one click at most, if not embedded in the email itself, right? Yeah. And, you know, you just got to do this process over and over and over again. And refine it. And not, yeah. and not expect just because of who you are or who you knew or what, what you may have once played you know, that, that it immediately translates because the booking people change. They may not know you. Um, the venue's needs change. The venue's goals change. The venue's, That's you know, super frustrating, by the way, when you've got a good thing going and then the booking person changes. and happens all the time. And, all the time. And honestly, a lot of times what I've experienced, and, and again, yes, in the music business, but also in others, it, when a new, when you've got an existing relationship, existing business happening, and suddenly there's a new agent put in, you know, to manage the, the relationship, whatever that means, you know, booking agent or, you know, buyer on a on a media side or whatever. As soon as that person comes in, they want to prove their worth. And the best way to prove worth is not to just leave everything the same as the previous person had put together. Right. Because yep. if that if you're going to do that then you need to explain to your new boss why you're leaving everything the same. Like, oh, I went, I did a deep dive. This is, that previous person had this stuff together. That What a system here. I'm going to learn from this. And, you know, that sort of thing. Most of the time, most people do not do that. Most people simply make changes. And so we've learned on the, you know, on the, on the media selling side, when there's a new person that comes in, the first thing we do is, okay, we'd love to get together. I want to walk you through the campaign. You know, there's some changes that we've been wanting that we've thought would be good for you over the years. And I want to show these to you because I think you might be able to take the same spend that you have and apply it a little more efficiently right now. Right. And you essentially doing their job for them. Right. Knowing or predicting that what they want to do is go back to their boss and say, oh, yeah, you know, that thousand bucks that we were spending over here. Well, we're still spending that same thousand bucks, but look what else we're getting for it now. Right. And now they love you and you're now in with them. It's their relationship, not the previous person's relationship. And the same thing happens with booking, except there's not a whole lot you can bring to the table that's different. That your permutations are about the same because you're already just going and delivering the best show you can every time you go. Right. So <laughs> it's, it's tough when you're put in that scenario and I've lost, I've seen it where I've lost gigs to it. I've also seen it where I've gotten gigs. You get a booking person. It's like, finally, there's a crack in the armor over there. Let's yeah. go. Right. Like, opportunity. so opportunity knocks. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny as we're having this conversation, I'm thinking about how, how much of a grind the sale process is for most, for most people bands. Yeah. And then I think about my friends who would tell me in the seventies, there were so many clubs, uh, you know, and, and it wasn't about, it wasn't about the sale. I mean, it was almost more, it was almost more demand than supply. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's, those are days gone by, man. Yeah. It's just, well, and it depends on the market. I'm sure there's, there's some markets out there where, where it's, you know, a, a musician's game, maybe, I don't know, probably not. <laughs> it's possible. Let's go, I can let's go there. hold. <laughs> let me have hope, Paul. Yeah. <sighs> hey, you know, real quick, as yeah, we man. get down to the end for this week, um, I definitely wanted to say something about Michael Lang passing away. Um, uh, you know, Woodstock is is a seminal moment in culture and in, in, in rock and roll. And you know, the interesting thing was that that was conceived largely as a as a cultural event, you know, and, and yeah. no good deed goes unpunished. And now we have, you know, 300 Woodstocks all over the world, you know, every weekend in the, <laughs> in the summertime. But, <laughs> but, you know, the concept that something happened and that, you know, kids, you know, found a way to walk there, found a way to camp there, found a way, you know, to get there. Because in the midst of a pandemic, feel, no less. Is that right? Yeah, man. That was like what? the Hong Kong flu was raging during Woodstock, right? Amazing. I did not know that. Yeah, I think it's it, part of the story. It's a it's a crazy part of the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a pretty it's just interesting, you know. We it, it I had no idea about it until COVID started and, you know, and then hear about every pandemic that that hit the globe and the ones you knew about yeah. and the ones you didn't, right? And that was one of them. I was like, "Really?" I looked into it. He's like, "Yeah, like millions of people died." Um, oh God! From this, from this thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. So my aunt went to Woodstock, and mm. um, 
and she, and I'd never heard of this part of the story that, you know, that sickness was raging. So I got to talk to her about that. But, you know, it's just the reflection that um, at once upon a time, you know, we talk about music, we talk about bookings, we talk about what it was like in the 70s or 60s or whatever it is. And, you know, we, it, it is a reflection that at a, at a point in time, as music was really at the center of, of cultural awareness, right? Like, you know, the songs commented on cultural things and, and, you know, the fashion that came out of the music world and the camaraderie that came out of the music world. It was a different thing once upon a time. Yeah. And if nothing else, you, you look back and, and you give gratitude to the foundational, you know, the pad, the, you know, the, the, the foundation that, that the pioneers of music and music festivals and bands, you know, that what they laid there, that still, you know, permeate today in, in many, like I said, there's a lot of music festivals. So clearly, you know, that was the, one of the first ways that the, that, that was proven could be a, a useful thing for people. But, you know, uh, that you had to be at a place because something was happening. Uh, I think that's a large part of what Woodstock, you know, gave to the world, you know, great music, great bands, great cultural awareness, great political awareness, social awareness, um, all good things. And so just a, a brief moment to say thanks to Michael Lang. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, the, it was, I mean, here we are like decades later talking about it, many decades later talking about. May, may we create something that people talk about decades later. Right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I assume this episode will be, will be exactly that. So there you go. Gig Gab 332 folks. That's, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> uh I don't know that there's much more to say. Maybe that's the uh, maybe that's it for today. We're we're navigating the waters of um, of indoor gigging, and it's been it's been interesting. Uh, you know, any any given member of the band has different reasons for being okay with a specific gig and not okay with another specific gig. And and I mean, it's all been fine. Like everybody understands. Like it's like we're you know, we don't, we don't know how to navigate these current waters with this, the way it is. Cause it's like, well, you're vaccinated. And does that mean, you, you know, all the stuff we talked about last week, it's just, you know, kind of coming into, into focus. And we've had a couple of gigs, you know, come up on the radar this week. And I was like, ah, maybe not that one, but this one seems okay. And it, you know, it's like things and it's fine. I mean, it's how it is. Thankfully the whole band is really sensitive to what, everybody needs and all of that. And it's, it's fine, but it's just, it's been interesting to, I mean, be a part of that process, but also, you know, observe that process. Like, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's okay. It's how it is. You gotta, we've had one uh, private gig get postponed from the end of January to the middle of March. Mm. Um, we have a rehearsal plan for the end of January. And I just heard from one of my guys that he's a little squeamish about, about that. And, you know, he's got to think about whether it's a good thing for him. So, yeah, um, you know, one one step up and two steps back. Yeah, it's right. It that's exactly it. It's it's so it, it feels much more nebulous now than it did uh, you know a year and a half ago where it was all fairly clear cut. Now it's like, well, is it okay? Like wh- weird thing is, why aren't the counties it, it it feels like the political fallout of making the decisions from before there just doesn't seem to be as much emphasis on what the on what the legality or the county directions for these things are now. So everybody seems to be rolling their own yeah. kind of plan. And and like New Year's Eve, most of the indoor New Year's Eve events, most of the venues canceled those. And you got to imagine that the primary mover for that, I mean, I'm sure there was public health safety, but in the absence of county direction, you have to think that people were not seeing the ticket sales for indoor things. Uh, and so yeah. they pulled the, pulled the plug on these things. So. I, I would assume that's part of it. Yeah, yeah. There's right. There's probably a a, a variety of factors, but but that's going to be one of them. Yeah. I don't know, man. That's crazy. It's crazy. We push on though. We push on. Know? Yeah. We we take the gigs that we're comfortable taking, and and you know, uh, and we we know that there's it's a calculated risk, right? Like, I mean, it, I I certain that's how, that's certainly how I'm looking at it. Is it, every risk is. Like or every opportunity to play is okay. Is it is it worth it to me? And and if the answer is yes, and it also turns out that the answer is yes for the people that I play with, well then yeah, we'll go quorum. do the gig. Yeah, we got a quorum, right? Well, it really needs to be unanimous right now, and and thankfully everybody's pretty sensitive to that, which is good. You know, that's we're all kind to each other, so that's kind of that's be that kind. part of it. That part of it's been really nice. Just everybody's like, yeah, it's it's okay. You know, it's. 
Um, I've been in bands before where it's like, must take the gig, you know, and, and, um, and right now it's, no, it's, it's okay. Like, let's talk it out. It's fine. You know, we're all, we're all finding our way here. So be kind and always be performing. I like it. That's where it's going to end. Thanks everybody for listening. Thanks for hanging out. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. How are you taking gigs? Are you taking gigs? How are you how are you selling for your band? How are you selling now? Yeah. yeah. See you next time. Bye, Dave. See you, Paul. Thanks, man. Bye.